back to my channel. Today is a video to help you get ready for advanced hire. I've chosen some topics that I think are really key to understand in depth to help you make a really confident start to advanced hire. The five topics that we're going to look at are atomic structure and periodicity, mole calculations, acids and bases, systematic organic chemistry and practical equipment and skills. The structure of this video will be practice questions and then I'll go over the answer. Actually trying to answer questions is a really good way to revise because it lets you know if you understand it or not. If you can't answer any of the questions then don't worry I will go over the answers but note down what areas that you're struggling with so that you can go back and revise those in more detail using your notes from higher. So the first section is atomic structure and periodicity. Pause the video and try and label this diagram, identify the element and then draw a diagram to show the electron arrangement for sulphur. In this diagram we have protons and neutrons. Protons are positive and neutrons have no charge and together they make up the nucleus of the atom. We also have electrons which go around the nucleus in energy shells and are negatively charged. This atom has seven protons. That's the atomic number which identifies the atom. And if we look up number seven on the periodic table, we'll find that that is nitrogen. We're also to draw a diagram to show the electron arrangement for sulfur. Sulfur has an electron arrangement of 286. So we have sulfur in the center and then the first shell with two electrons second shell with eight electrons and then a third shell with six electrons. Remember that they will fill singly before they will pair up. Pause the video and label the periodic table to show metals, non-metals, alkali metals, transition metals, halogens and noble gases. Then complete the bonding table for the first 20 elements. On the periodic table there is a step line which separates the periodic table into two. On the left of the step line, we find the metals, and on the right of the step line, we find the non-metals. There are then certain groups that you're expected to be familiar with. The first of those is the alkali metals, which is group one. The transition metals are the section in the center here, which you'll get to learn about in advanced higher. The halogens are group 7 and then finally the noble gases are group 8. For the bonding in the first 20 elements, lithium, beryllium, sodium, magnesium, aluminium, potassium and calcium all show metallic bonding. Boron, carbon graphite, carbon diamond and silicon are all covalent networks. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine and chlorine are covalent molecules, specifically diatomic. Carbon is fluorine, phosphorus, P4, sulphur, S8 are all covalent molecules and you need to know their specific molecular formula. Helium, neon and argon are all monatomic. Pause the video now and define electronegativity, covalent radius, first ionization energy. Then complete the trend table below. Explain why the third ionization energy of magnesium is significantly higher than the first and second. Electronegativity is the attraction of an atom for a bonding pair of electrons. Covalent radius is half the distance between two nuclei within a covalent bond and is equivalent to atomic size. First ionisation energy is the energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of atoms in the gaseous state. The trends in electronegativity are that across a period, electronegativity increases. This is due to increasing nuclear charge. Down a group, electronegativity decreases. This is due to shielding. Across a period, covalent radius decreases. This is due to increasing nuclear charge. And down a group, covalent radius increases. This is due to shielding. 
and the increased number of shells. Across the period, first ionisation energy increases. This is due to nuclear charge. And down a group, first ionisation energy decreases because of shielding. The third ionisation energy of magnesium is significantly higher than the first and second because the third electron is being removed from a full shell of electrons. Let's look now at different mole calculations. Pause the video and try these. Calculate the mass of sodium hydroxide required to make 250 mL of a 0.5 mole per litre solution. The first thing we're going to do is to calculate the moles of sodium hydroxide that we need. We're going to do this by multiplying concentration and volume. Remember to turn the volume into litres. Zero point one two five moles are required of sodium hydroxide. We now want to know the mass of sodium hydroxide. We do this by multiplying the moles by gram formula mass. To get the gram formula mass of sodium hydroxide, we need the formula, which is NaOH. The relative atomic mass of sodium is twenty three. Oxygen is sixteen and hydrogen is one, giving a gram formula mass of forty. We then multiply this by the number of moles to get a mass of sodium hydroxide of 5 grams. Calculate the concentration of a 500 ml solution made with 45 grams of sodium chloride. To be able to find concentration, we need moles. We've been given the mass of sodium chloride. We can then work out how many moles of sodium chloride were measured out by taking mass divided by gram formula mass. To get gram formula mass, we need the formula, which is NaCl. Sodium has a relative atomic mass of 23, chlorine a relative atomic mass of 35.5. This gives a gram formula mass of 58.5. If we take the mass from the question 45 and divide by the gram formula mass 58.5, then we get a number of moles of 0.77. We can then use this to work out the concentration by taking moles divided by volume. The moles are 0 0.77 and we're dividing by the volume in litres 0 0.5. This gives a concentration of 1.5 moles per litre. Calculate the mass of carbon dioxide produced when 50 grams of butanol is burned completely in oxygen. To be able to work out the mass of carbon dioxide, we need to know how many moles of carbon dioxide are produced. We've been given the mass of butanol which has been burned, which means we can work out the number of moles of butanol. If we take the mass divided by the gram formula mass, the gram formula mass of butanol can be calculated from the formula. The mass in the question is 50 grams and the gram formula mass is 74. This gives 0 0.68 moles of butanol used. One mole of butanol would produce four moles of carbon dioxide. However, we only have 0 0.68 moles of butanol. We then need to times this by four to find out how many moles of carbon dioxide were produced. This gives 2.7 moles of carbon dioxide. We can calculate the mass of carbon dioxide by taking the moles multiplied by the gram formula mass, this time of carbon dioxide. The number of moles is 2.7, the gram formula mass is 44. This means that 119 grams of carbon dioxide would be produced. Pause the video now and try this titration calculation. An excess of acidified potassium iodide is added to bleach. This converts the iodide to iodine, according to this equation. The iodine produced was titrated with sodium thiosulfate. A 25 ml sample of diluted bleach was transferred to a conical flask and excess acidified potassium iodide added. 
The iodine produced was titrated with 0.098 moles per litre sodium thiosulfate, requiring an average volume of 9 millilitres to reach the end point. Calculate the concentration in moles per litre of sodium hypochlorite in the diluted bleach. If we go back to the start, we can have a look and see what parts of the equations are required. Sodium hypochlorite is the part which is in bleach, which is this part here underlined in pink. We are then reacting that with potassium iodide to produce iodine. This iodine is then itself titrated with sodium thiosulfate. The sodium thiosulfate is the thing that we have information about in the question. So we know the concentration and the volume of sodium thiosulfate used. This means we can calculate the number of moles of sodium thiosulfate using concentration times volume. This gives the number of moles of sodium thiosulfate as 0 0.000882. If we look in the question, we can see that we have two moles of sodium thiosulfate reacting with one mole of iodine. Going back to the original equation, one mole of iodine is produced when one mole of sodium hypochlorite is present. This means we have a mole ratio between the three. Two moles of sodium thiosulfate reacts with one mole of iodine which reacts with one mole of hypochlorite. We have 0 0.000882 moles of thiosulfate. Dividing by two, this would react with 0 0.000441 moles of iodine, which must have been produced by 0 0.000441 moles of the original hypochlorite. This means we can calculate the concentration of hypochlorite using moles divided by volume. The volume in the question is 25 mils. We have moles of 0.000441 divided by the volume in litres, which is 0.025. This gives a concentration of the diluted bleach of 0.035 moles per litre. Pause the video now and try this percentage yield calculation. The equation that we use for percentage yield is percentage yield equals actual yield divided by theoretical yield multiplied by 100. In the question we have two numbers. We have 2.5 grams of ethanol which is being used to produce 2.9 grams of ethyl ethanoate. This 2.9 grams of ethyl ethanoate is our actual yield. We need to calculate the theoretical yield. To be able to calculate the theoretical yield, we need to start with the moles of the reactant that we used. To do this, we're going to take mass divided by gram formula mass, both of which are given in the question. So we have 2.5 grams of ethanol divided by 46 for the gram formula mass. This gives us 0 0.054 moles of ethanol. One mole of ethanol produces one mole of ethyl ethanoate. This means that if we use up all of our 0 0.054 moles of ethanol, we should produce 0 0.054 moles of ethyl ethanoate. However, the theoretical mass is always higher than the actual mass. To work this out, we're going to take moles multiplied by gram formula mass. So we have 0 0.054 multiplied by the gram formula mass 88 to give a theoretical mass of 4.78. This is the mass that should be produced if the reaction is 100% efficient. For the final percentage yield, we take the actual yield from the question divided by the theoretical yield that we've calculated and multiply by 100. This gives a percentage yield of 61%. Pause the video now and try these questions on acids and bases. The pH scale runs from below 1 to above 14. The numbers below 7 are all acidic, with the lower number being stronger. pH of 7 is neutral and above 7 is alkaline, 
with the higher number being stronger alkalis. Indicator is used to determine the pH of a substance, as the colour of the indicator depends on pH and can be compared to a chart. Water dissociates into the ions hydrogen and hydroxide. Because every water molecule dissociates into equal numbers of hydrogen and hydroxide ions, this means that water is overall neutral. For this first word equation, we have hydrochloric acid and magnesium hydroxide. Hydrochloric acid and magnesium hydroxide react to form magnesium chloride and water. Ethanoic acid and lithium react to form lithium ethanoate and hydrogen. Sulfuric acid and ammonia react to produce ammonium sulfate. Weak acids do not fully dissociate into ions in water. Strong acids fully dissociate into ions in water. Strong acids react quickly with metal or marble chips. Weak acids will react more slowly. Strong acids will have higher conductivity than weak acids do. This is because there are more ions in the strong acid solution compared to the weak acid solution. The pH of a strong acid will be low, whereas the pH of a weak acid will be higher, closer to 7. They will both require the same volume to neutralise 25 mL of sodium hydroxide. Pause the video now and name the functional groups for each of these homologous series. The first homologous series is the alkenes. Their functional group is the carbon to carbon single bond. The alkenes have a carbon to carbon double bond. Alcohols have the OH, the hydroxyl functional group. Par carboxylic acids have a C double bond O OH which is a carboxyl functional group. Esters have a C double bond O, O link, which is the ester link or the carboxylate. Amines have an NH bond. This can be known as an amino bond. Amides have an NH to C double bond O link. This is an amide link or sometimes called a peptide link in a protein. Aldehydes have a C double bond O and an H. This is a carbonyl on the end of a chain, whereas ketones have a C double bond O in the middle of a chain, again a carbonyl. Pause the video and name each type of reaction. This first reaction has ethane plus hydrogen to become ethane. We are adding hydrogen on, so this is an addition reaction. Propane plus oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water is a combustion reaction. Methanol plus propanoic acid to produce methyl propanoate and ester and water is an example of condensation. Ethanol to become ethanoic acid is an oxidation reaction. Propanone to become propantool is the opposite, a reduction reaction. And a protein being broken down into amino acids is hydrolysis. Pause the video and name these four compounds. For this first compound, we need to find the longest chain which has the functional group attached. That's this chain of three through the middle. We then number from the end closest to the functional group. The functional group is the hydroxyl group, which is on number 2, and we have a branch here on number 2 as well, which is a methyl. Let's start building the name. On the second carbon, we have a methyl branch. This is attached to a chain of 3, which is based on propane. Also on the second carbon, we have a functional group the hydroxyl group, which is given the suffix all. Looking at our second example, we have a chain of five. We need to number from the end closest to the functional group. And we can identify the functional group here is a carbonyl. This carbonyl is within the center of the chain. This means that this is a ketone. We have five carbons. So this is going to be based on pentane. On the third carbon, we have the functional group. 
and the ending is on when we have a ketone. For this next example, our longest chain is a chain of four. We need to number from the end closest to the functional group, and that is the carboxyl functional group. You include the carbon of the carboxyl functional group when you do your numbering. We then have two branches which are the same, they're both methyl branches. To build the name, we need to declare the two numbers that the methyls are attached to. We need to put in the prefix di to show that we have two methyl groups. And then they're attached to a chain of four, so this is based on butane. We don't need to put a number for the functional group for, an for a carboxylic acid because it's always on number one. The end of the name is then butanoic acid. For our final example, we have a chain of three here through the middle. We need to number from the end closest to the functional group. The functional group itself is a carbonyl on carbon one, which makes this an aldehyde. And we have two branches, both methyl. Even though both of the branches are on number two, we do need to have a number for each of them. So the name will start 2,2. Two, two. We've then got two methyl branches, so we need to have dimethyl. And this is attached to a chain of three. So this is going to be based on propane. And because we have an aldehyde, we don't need to put in a number. We just change the end to AL, AL for propanol to show where the functional group is. Pause the video and try and answer these questions about practical equipment and skills. Define the term standard solution. A standard solution is a solution of accurately known concentration. Describe the steps for making a standard solution of sodium hydroxide. Measure out the required mass using a balance. Dissolve this into a little deionized water in a beaker and then transfer to the standard flask. Rinse the beaker and transfer to this to the standard flask also. Fill with deionized water so that the meniscus sits on the line and then stopper and invert to mix. What are the two pieces of equipment needed for a titration and describe the steps in a titration? To carry out a titration, you need a pipette and a burette. First, rinse the pipette and burette with a little of the solutions that are to be used. Fill the pipette to the line and transfer to a conical flask. Add indicator if required and place on a white tile. Fill the burette, including the tip, and note down the start reading. Add one centimeter cube portions from the burette to the flask with swirling until a permanent color change is observed and then note the end value. Rinse the flask and measure out another aliquot using the pipette. Repeat the titration, adding from the burette quickly until within one centimeter cubed of the previous titer. Add dropwise from this point with swirling until, until color change. Repeat until concordant. What equipment would be used to heat a mixture of alcohol and carboxylic acid for ester synthesis? What else would be required? Because both alcohols and carboxylic acids are flammable, you would not be able to heat this with a flame. You would need to use a water bath or an electric heating mantle for heating. You would also need a condenser to stop any gases from escaping. What is chromatography? Define RF. Chromatography is a separation technique which involves the use of paper often. RF equals the distance that the spot travels divided by the distance that the solvent front travels. Thank you for watching my video. I hope that you found it helpful and it's helped you identify any areas that you feel you need to revise before starting your new course. Remember to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new videos throughout the year. And you can follow me on Twitter for updates at Miss Adams Kim and Instagram Miss Adams Chemistry for flashcards throughout the year. Bye for now.